you tell your patients now who come okay. to see you about their diet? So yeah, this is, I, actually I can already, already tell that this is much this is much better. Um, so say they would come in and see me, and, and you know they would say they on a pretty healthy diet, and you know we would start to talk about it. And it's like if you ever if you ever watched the movie Forks Over Knives, a lot to do um, with our health, and you know mainly I would start with you know the the greens and the plant based nutrition. So you know when you eat a lot of uh, greens such as kale and Swiss chard and broccoli. Um, in spinach, you produce nitric oxide through the bacteria in your in your tongue and your amylase, and it causes your arteries to dilate. And when you have a disease such as high blood pressure or coronary artery disease, there's already abnormalities in your blood vessels. So whether you've had a heart attack or not, if you take blood pressure medicine, your blood vessels are abnormal. They quit making nitric oxide to the point to the degree that you need to keep your blood pressure down. So by eating these greens, you can actually use them as medicine and dilate your blood vessels. And so your blood pressure can come down, you know, your cholesterol will come down when you decrease the intake of animal products. And, you know, um, it, it evolved over time because, you know, it's kind of scary when you walk in the office and somebody says, you know, we don't want you to eat any meat, beef, dairy, or anything right up front, and you have to change your radical diet, and people start to think about, oh my goodness, I'm just going to be eating carrots and lettuce, I'm going to starve to death, I can't ever go out with my friends. You know, the snowball effect starts to occur. And so I try to temper it, you know, and we talk about what they do do. And we started the nutrition course because of it. It's like, well, nobody's, you know, and then I, you know, the reassuring part is, you know, most of us weren't born eating plant based. You know, where the standard American diet, you know, chicken on Sunday and roast beef and, and pork chops and a starch and a, and a vegetable is how we grew up. So you have to learn to, you know, uh, adjust and alter things. And, uh, you know, uh, so we, we kind of go over how you might, you know, substitute things out to, to make those meals better. And, uh, you know, that it takes some education. So we started the class so that I could teach people how to, how to prepare food in 30 minutes and get it on the table. That it, and, and so they could see it, that it looked good. It wasn't scary. It was actually good to look at and tasted good. And then a lot of times it wasn't that much different than what they were already eating. You know, things like cabbage rolls or pizza or, or you know, vegetable soup or potato soup were, you know, uh, plant-based. They just didn't call it that. Uh, so, so we took kind of the scariness out of it a little bit. That's great. That's great. I really like hearing that. Um, what kinds of changes do you see with your patients as they take your advice on diet and they really do listen, take this to heart and really make the changes? It, it, it's been amazing. Uh, for me, you know, I read Dr. Esselstyn's book. I saw, you know, the people that he had. Uh, and then when I started to see stress tests become normal, even though their bypass grafts were blocked, uh, rheumatoid arthritis went away. Psoriasis that people had had a year, for years went away. Um, their, obviously, their chest pain goes away. Uh, one of the most dramatic things is diabetes. Um, again, I have such a family history of diabetes and people that were on that, you know, family members that have been on medications for years and years and years. And I've been able to get people almost completely off of their medications if they're willing to work with me in about two months. Uh, and sometimes even quicker than that. But these are people that were on, you know, three or four diabetic medications and insulin. As soon as they, you know, adopt a whole food plant-based diet, get the oil out, get the fat out of their diet, their, their glucose normalizes. Their hemoglobin A1C drops from the eights back down into the fives. And it and it just blows my mind every time that I see how easy it is to reverse diabetes. And it angers me when I see, you know, let's find a cure. Um, you know, what can we do to it? We only knew what was causing this, um, you know, and I want to scream um, that it's so, this is such an easy disease to reverse. And, it, and it's such a disease that has so many side effects and so many complications. It's a devastating disease that can be fixed very easily with nutrition. And it's not touched by any of the medication. And the, and the problem is that most of our medications are Band-Aids. You know, we, we treat a number, a blood pressure number. We treat a glucose number. We treat a cholesterol number. But it doesn't do anything to change the underlying progression of that disease. You know, the cholesterol medicine stop production of or decrease col uh, cholesterol production by the liver. But it doesn't do anything to keep the bad cholesterol from being deposited in the arteries in the first place. You know, keeping a glucose under control when the insulin levels are very high in the bloodstream 
Um, it doesn't do anything to help them with, this, with the side effects of diabetes. Treating a blood pressure problem uh, by lowering the volume doesn't, doesn't change why you got high blood pressure in the, in the first place. You know, continuing to have a bad immune system and continuing to have inflammation in your system doesn't change why you have rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, you know, so these, these medications don't attack the cause, they just attack the symptoms. And so when we change the nutrition, things just clear up right away. I had a question about protein. Um, how does a one know if their protein is low? Like, if do you test your patients with some kind of numeric testing, or um, how would one know this? Right. Um, you know, so uh, interesting that you know the protein question is is really well addressed in a book called the China Study. And uh, you know, way back in the 1800s, uh, uh, researchers measured the nitrogen in and nitrogen out, which is a function of protein. And we need about five to six percent of our calories from protein. And, and the government actually increased that to two standard deviations. So 10% of the calories of protein is more than adequate. And so that turns out to be about 40 to 45 grams for a woman and about 50 to 55 grams for a man. And the reality of it is if you eat enough calories, you get way, you know, you get plenty of protein. You never have to worry about not getting enough protein. And when they looked in the China study, Specifically, you know, these a lot of these people were on a, a fairly low protein diet that did very, very well. Pretty much 10% of your calories from protein is more than adequate, and that amounts to about 45 grams for a woman and 55 grams for a man. Anything more than that is excessive. If somebody wants to be a bodybuilder and add a lot of muscle on, they just need to eat more calories and, and plant calories, and you'll get plenty of protein. There's not a doctor deficient in, you know, that, that deals in protein deficiency. There's not an American that's really protein deficient unless someone is truly starving. And, and even when we look back at uh, countries, third world countries, that there are people are nutritionally starving, it's more of a calorie deficit than a protein deficit. Once someone is fed enough uh, calories from plants, it, you get plenty of, of protein calories. So there's no need for us to measure macronutrients or add up the calories of protein um, that we eat a day. And you know, just as an example, your oatmeal would have 10 grams of protein. A banana has a gram of protein. So every piece of fruit has one to two grams of protein. And, Grains and potatoes and rice have about 10 grams of protein. So uh, beans have a tremendous source of protein. So you, you get adequate proteins very, very easily. And if someone is losing weight, or the, the thing I, I guess I hear most often is people say, I'm weak on this diet. I, I think I need more protein. The reality of it is if you're weak, it's not because of protein. You didn't lose muscle mass to the point you're falling down weak you may not be getting enough calories because you're used to eating a standard American diet that is very calorie dense. Once you start eating plant foods, it's not so calorie dense. So maybe you're, we, our body runs on glucose. We use glucose for fuels to run our muscles. We don't use protein for fuels to run our muscles. So if you're getting adequate calories, you're getting adequate glucose and you should be fine. So it's not protein deficiency it's, it's not uh, hallmarked by being tired, which is you know what I oftentimes hear people think I might be protein deficient. Hi, I'm Mary, and I'm a, I'm a diabetic, and I have some neuropathy in my right foot and ankle, and I was I don't have the pain that other people have, but it's just numb like, and I'm mm -hmm. wondering if the nerve damage would reverse as well as you know, stopping the food. I knew that stopping the sugar would take care of the, um, the stop the diabetes, but I didn't realize, I don't know if it will reverse the damage in my foot, if it will let go. <laughs> well, that's a very good question, and I'm glad you brought up the sugar aspect as well, because diabetes, even though we used to call it sugar diabetes, is not a problem of sugar, but a, but a problem of fat. And the neuropathy actually occurs because the little tiny nerves in your distal extremities, whether it be your feet or your hand, doesn't get the adequate blood flow that it should. And the, because these, the diabetes affects those little tiny blood vessels. So when we get the fat out of our diet and the fat out of our, off our plate and, and the fat we wear out, and we start eating these nitric oxide um, rich greens, 
we actually improve the blood flow to these tiny little nerves and the diabetic neuropathy will go away. And there was a great study published in the 70s that actually took diabetics, had them eat plants and starches and fruit, and had them not lose any weight and didn't even look whether their glucose was going to be controlled or not at all. But just by getting the animal, pro animal protein and animal fat out of their diet, their diabetic neuropathy, 75% of them improved in just a couple of weeks. Um, the side effect was a lot of them got off their diabetic medication, their cholesterol went down. So it's, it is, the diabetic neuropathy does get better once you get the animals out of your diet. Hi, Dr. Delaney. Um, my question is based on diabetes also because um, the standard practice for women, 45 grams or 45 um, carbs for the meals and 60 carbs for the guys. So how do you recommend that for your patients when they're, or do you not recommend counting carbs? I tell, yes, I would advise you to rip up those papers because it has <laughs> nothing to do with carbohydrates. We know that eating 17 pieces of fruit a day will actually improve your diabetes if you take the fat out. Diabetes is a problem of the fat blocking the muscle cell from having glucose go in it. So if you think about the muscle being a room and the door being the fat that's blo being blocked. So when we decrease the fat in the diet, then the glucose can get into the cell. So if you were to eat a, a piece of bread with butter on it and an apple, and then follow up with an apple, you would see a rise in your blood sugar and in your insulin. But if you would get rid of that butter, you wouldn't see near, and it, the glucose would go up, but it would come down so much quicker because that fat wasn't blocking the uptake of the glucose. So by eating a whole food plant-based diet, that's exactly what you're doing. You're taking the fat out of your diet. So the carbohydrates, potatoes and rice and fruit aren't what's hurting you. It's the fat in the animals that are actually from the animal products that are actually blocking. And it could be plant fats as well. So when we get rid of the fat that you wear and the fat that you eat, everything normalizes. So I don't have people count at all. I have people eat nutrient-dense foods. So oatmeal with fruit for breakfast, a big salad with beans and, and rice and you know different vegetables, potato, or, um, tomatoes and cucumbers and peppers, and a dinner with beans and greens and a, and a potato or, or, or potato soup or vegetable soup. These all make diabetes, uh, the, the diabetes, the glucose number improve right away. The more whole foods you can eat, the better. I take my patients that have, say, uh, glucose is in the 300s, um, and we have them just do that. We have them eat just foods that they can identify. So, you know, steamed vegetables, uh, steamed uh, squash and zucchini and carrots and cabbage and rice for, for breakfast and dinner. Uh, beans and rice and greens for, for dinner as well, and, um, and then the oatmeal and fruit for breakfast. Their glucose has dropped like a rock down into the, into the low 100s. The only thing we do as far as portion control is for the calorie-dense foods. That are, so rice and potatoes are a little bit more calorie-dense than carrots and zucchini. So if we want to get people off their medications really quick, we limit those to about a cup of rice at lunch and a potato or a cup of rice at dinner. All the beans you want, all the vegetables you want, and all the fruit you want. That works great because you lower their medication. Would, would you advise them if they were going to take this route that they would work with their health provider to be sure that they're, low, they're changing their medication? Because if it's dropping down to 100, that would be a concern, wouldn't it, with the medication? Yes, at, at, actually the, the, the glucose drops so quickly that you do have to work with a healthcare provider. What I've found, unfortunately, is we as physicians are taught that once somebody goes on a diabetic medication, they're never coming off. We only add. And so most physicians are very, very uncomfortable at taking those medications off because you can you can imagine that people do fad diets from time to time and so are they withhold their calories and their sugar drops only to go back on you know and to fall off so you know and and the way that um, medical practices work and offices work 
doctors are seeing, you know, hundreds of patients a day. They can't do this close follow-up that they need to to actually get people off their medications and follow them close enough. So you're you're really um, better off at finding somebody that that you know that's on board with plant-based nutrition, uh, or your doctor to have a conversation with them and say, look, listen, I know you may not agree with this, but I'm going to show you my numbers, and I and I really need you to work with me on decreasing my my medicine re, uh, requirements. Hi, Dr. Delaney. I've got a question that uh, is probably unusual. But, um, and, and first of all, let me tell you, I took my cholesterol from 254 to 160, so I'm really excited over that. But I have a real hard time uh, getting enough calories, um, and I track my calories every day because I don't want to lose weight, but um, my BMI is like 18, and I just feel underweight, and I just don't know how to get the calories. I eat nut butters, I eat bananas, I eat, but, but vegetables have so few calories. So I'm hoping you have some good advice for me. Yeah, I mean, um, so obviously oatmeal, uh, more frequent meals sometimes if you're not a diabetic, that, that, you know, that will help you to gain, gain the weight. Obviously, we need to make sure your thyroid is okay, that you're not hyperthyroid. But if you're not hyperthyroid and you're otherwise healthy, then, you know, I looked at things like potatoes and, and rice and frica and barley and soups that are concentrated, so potato soups, um, adding some pasta into your, uh, your soups, adding more beans, uh, even processed beans such as soy curls, um, some tofu, some tempeh. Um, those are all things that you know, can add calories to your diet. Maybe, maybe it's more frequent meals so that you can get the calories, the calories in. Um, and eat when you're hungry, but you know, uh, most of the time, if if you can, you know, if you can maintain that BMI of 18, that's that's normal. Um, you know, we we do, you know, and most of the time, people drop weight and then they level off. Um, so you know, I, I really, uh, you know, again, adding you know peas and and again the the potatoes and and you know mashed potatoes makes them more concentrated. Uh, hummus makes beans more concentrated. So those are ways to get a little bit more calories in, you know, if you're a small, small appetite person. I've been diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. I do have a factor five blood disorder. And I was wondering if a plant-based diet would um, affect um, or counteract the effects of this. Well, once Atrial fibrillation is the most common arrhythmia that we see as people age. Most of the time, it is associated with long-standing high blood pressure or valvular heart disease. Um, sometimes it occurs for no, no apparent reason. We see it a little bit more in athletes that have been uh, collegiate athletes uh, early on and then have kind of a thick heart muscle. Once the electrical system starts to fray and we get these short circuits, most likely it doesn't go away. Uh, sometimes it's intermittent and it can be intermittent for a long time, but once it becomes chronic, it kind of stays chronic. The good news is, is as long as you're on a blood thinner, the risk of a stroke, which is the most, uh, is the worst complication, uh, is, is, lar is, is really largely reduced. People that have atrial fibrillation live just as long as people that don't have atrial fibrillation, as long as they're protected from these embolic events with blood thinners. The blood thinner is also going to take care of your factor deficiency as well as your risk because of your risk for clotting. So, no, it, it really, a plant-based diet doesn't, it hasn't been shown to reverse these arrhythmias. However, it does reverse things that may make things worse over time. So if your heart chambers are enlarged and you have poor circulation, you're more at risk for more and different kinds of arrhythmias. So becoming plant-based can actually protect you from future arrhythmias, different arrhythmias, or other cardiac events. So, you know, while it won't reverse that particular thing, most likely, um, it may make it easier to control as far as the rate, but more than anything, uh, decrease your risk of having subsequent issues. Hi, Dr. Delaney. It is so Hi. awesome to be asking a question of a plant-based cardiologist. I am yes. so honored. <laughs> it is awesome. Uh, what is your position about drinking? Uh, specifically, what do you recommend plant-based people uh, drink 
and I'm more I'm most interested in what you have to say about caffeine and alcohol. Oh, I can say you can have you can have the water, drink water when you're thirsty. Um, I, I'm going to go with the good to the bad. Let's start. Let's start that way. Uh, so, so water is great, um, and I, I typically stay away from juices just because you're getting rid of the fiber. Personally, I, I do a smoothie in the morning after I run. That's in the blender, so I have vegetables and um, I typically have spinach and fruit and water and flaxseed in my in my morning uh, smoothie. Um, green tea has a lot of antioxidants, so that's a good. We know the hibiscus tea will lower your blood pressure, and I have people that have normalized their blood pressure on five, bag, you know, five cups of hibiscus tea during the day. Um, as we progress with caffeine um, and coffee, you know, some days coffee is in the news as being good for you, and some days the coffee is bad for you. The reality of it is the coffee bean is a bean, and there's lots of polyphenols and antioxidants in coffee. Um, and most studies show people do quite well drinking coffee. Some people have side effects to caffeine. Um, some people's body doesn't, and caffeine is a stimulant that increases the sympathetic activity in our system. So some people just don't do well with that, that rush of, of caffeine and the, and the increased adrenaline. So those people have to watch it and may, and may need to back off on it. Um, you know, I, I, it's, caffeine is an addictive drug. Uh, it's a drug that we, uh, we kind of become tolerant of. So I don't, I don't suggest that you get all your liquids from caffeinated beverages, but if you like a cup of coffee in the morning uh, or two, I don't think anything is wrong with that as, as long as it doesn't cause you, um, you grief as far as your blood pressure goes. You don't notice a big rise, and, and that's okay. And, of course, as long as you're not putting a bunch of creamers in it that make it a high-calorie dessert. Moving, moving along, uh, as far as alcoholic beverages, I always tell my patients I'm half Irish and half Italian, so what do you think? Uh, but, uh, I, you know, the, the Blue Zones is, a, is an area where people live to be 100 and, and do quite well. And typically in those areas, they, they have some alcohol, mostly in the form of a little wine. They don't over uh, over imbibe. Uh, it's more of, you know, a, a little drink here and a little drink there. Um, we know that more than, you know, two alcoholic beverages a day probably increases the risk of breast cancer in women. Um, certainly, if you have a problem with alcohol, it's not in your best interest. If you have abnormal liver or fatty liver, alcohol is not in your best interest. It's, if you are overweight, it's a source of calories. It's not in your best interest. Um, but, you know, that being said, if, you know, if it's something that you like to do and have an alcoholic drink at night, uh, and it's and it's one and it's not the size of a you know a blender then I you know I think it's probably okay. Hi, this is a hopefully easy question. Um, you mentioned steamed vegetables. Is it okay to roast your vegetables in? Especially, is it okay to microwave them? Um, it, that that's a good question, and it, it ta I have to share with you one little funny story from my office. Um, I had a patient that uh, was in the hospital with heart failure, and we talked about the plant-based diet and how, you know, eating lots of vegetables, and you could roast them, and that would be good. And he comes back to the office, and he's not lost any weight whatsoever, and his cholesterol is still, you know, pretty high. And he's, you know, he's swearing up and down that he's, you know, he's roasting all these vegetables. It's like, well, how are you roasting the vegetables? And, I, I, you know, I wish you could see my hand expressions, but he had this big tray that he would put all kinds of vegetables on. And then he showed me how he, he poured oil over the vegetables to roast them like you would water a garden with a, with a, you know, a sprinkler can. And it's like, no, 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 no. You can't use oil to, to roast the vegetables. So if you want to roast vegetables and you like the little crunchy taste, that's fine. And what I typically do is either spritz them with water or a vegetable juice or even roll them in, 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 in almond milk. And then, uh, then I roast the vegetables. So that, that can then put my spices on and that keeps them moist. There was a study that looked at sweet potatoes, whether they were boiled, microwaved, or roasted. And actually, the most nutrients in a sweet potato was obtained by just boiling them. Now, you don't lose all the nutrients in a microwave or roasting them. So if you're going to eat your, if the only way you like your sweet potatoes or you prefer them roasted, then by all means, eat the sweet potatoes. You're not losing that many nutrients. And as far as microwave go, you know, there, I've looked at the data and I, I really don't think that we have anything to worry about a microwave. Microwave heating heats things from the outside in as opposed from the inside out as conventional heating. 
So, you know, steaming some uh, zucchini in the, in the uh, or microwaving a potato that makes it quick, um, I have no problem with that. Um, so I think any way that you're going to eat your vegetables is a good way as long as you're not, you know, drowning them in oil and salt and, you know, or other kind of bad sauces. Dr. Laney, I want to thank you for your lecture. It's excellent. But I think we need to talk about the diabetes that you're talking about is primarily type 2. Type Correct. Two, type, you know, type 2 diabetes can easily be reversed with a plant-based diet, low-fat diet, and a, a diet that's not so high in carbohydrates because it's not just the fat, it's also insulin resistance to the cells caused by the high uh, carbohydrate diet that most Americans eat, which is primarily processed carbohydrates. So I just wanted to add that and see if you agree. I do, but I will also tell you that there are studies. In, no, so type 1 diabetes is more what we call juvenile diabetes. And it's actually an autoimmune disease where the islet cells have been attacked and destroyed. So those people require insulin. But there, there are studies showing that type 1 diabetics that eat a plant-based diet require much less insulin and have much better control than when they have um, a diet with animal protein. And I personally take care of some, some juvenile diabetes that have actually markedly lowered their hemoglobin A1C and actually reversed disease because you have to remember that juvenile diabetes, those people tend to have the most vascular disease and the most complications over time. And I and I've actually seen juvenile diabetics reverse their coronary artery disease, improve their overall cardiac function and their insulin requirements eating a whole food plant based diet. So while it won't reverse juvenile diabetes, it markedly improves the quality of life. But I have I have an A1C of 5.4 and I manage it very well on, on primarily a plant based low fat diet and no junk food whatsoever so but i have really enjoyed your talk and i just want to thank you for that yes yes and you're absolutely right you can get juvenile diabetes up until your 30s or type 1 diabetes so you know type 1 juvenile they're the same thing but it's not you're right just because it's juvenile doesn't mean it occurs at a young age it can occur all the way up into the 30s um, and likewise type 2 diabetes which we used to call adult onset diabetes can now occur in children so the, the waters have been very much muddied by our standard American diet. Hi, doctor, and thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. For us that are interested in maybe having service with you, I, in the introduction it said that it's a membership practice. How do we get involved to spend time and learn from you personally? Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you very much for that question. Um, I have a website, and I think uh, Kathy has some pamphlets there, uh, drdelaney.com, and it's spelled out D-O-C-T-O-R-D-U-L-A-N-E-Y.com. And on that website, um, you have the ability to just join the program, but we have four types of, um, uh, actually three types, I'm sorry, of programs to join. Um, we have two online programs where the one program is... Um, through email and webinars and newsletters and uh, information uh, like that. And then our, our second online we call a level two program. Uh, I um, speak with you once a month as well as my daughter who you're gonna meet here in a little bit who is a registered dietitian. She also speaks with you once a month. And then you have access to unlimited emails and, and uh, webinars and other information. And then there's our standard membership um, that you really don't have to be in winter. Hey, you can, I'm sorry, you can be any place in the, in the world and still join, or you can come and visit me or we can do it all online. Um, and you know, we see people for that membership, um, as much as they need to be see or seen or talk to you as much as you need to be uh, spoken with. Um, during that full membership, we actually uh, do kind of a comprehensive assessment and discussion of what your goals are for your optimal health, uh, whether it be to get off of medications or to improve your activity or, uh, you know, whatever, whatever your goals are. And we kind of we, we come up with a plan and, and, a, and, a, and a map on how to achieve those goals over over a time period. 
And so we work together to get to attain that goal and, and go together on that journey. So, um, you know, people, as they get older, we tend to get uh, decrease. Uh, our movements tend to decrease. Our muscles tend to decrease. Uh, so we assess all that, uh, give people exercise programs. Uh, nutritional advice and support. Um, of course, anybody that's close by can come to our nutrition classes as much as they want. Um, we're also starting to put those nutrition, record those nutrition classes for people that aren't in town so they can listen to them. Uh, you can't see me cook or taste what I cook, but um, you know, otherwise, uh, you know, we can get most of that information to people that are remote as well. So, you know, even if you want to call the office and set up an appointment to speak with me more about what it entails or to help you decide which program you might like, uh, I'll be more than happy to speak with anybody about that. Hi, Dr. Delaney, this is Debbie and uh, I have rheumatoid arthritis. I'm 66 years old and I come down with that kind of late in life. And I've gone on the whole food, plant-based diet for about a month now. And uh, my goal is to come off all that medication and also to lose weight. Wonderful. Um, you know, it, um, that it's, it's one of the things that it's, it's so amazing that rheumatoid arthritis can be helped so much with a whole food, plant-based diet. Um, by decreasing the dairy and, and animal protein, the inflammation goes down rather quickly. And um, so if you have a lot of joint deformity, that might not reverse, but certainly the pain goes away dramatically uh, and your ability to reduce your medication will go away dramatically. So there's no reason to not be very optimistic that your rheumatoid arthritis can be halted and reversed and you can feel a lot better off of medications. Good afternoon, Dr. Delaney. Good afternoon. Uh, I have a question about salt and sugar. My dad used to eat very, very salty and a, with a lot of sugar, and I do the same thing. Uh, I put like three spoons of, uh, of sugar to my coffee, and my dad used to do the same. Uh, and he died in an accident at 87, and he was healthy. And, well, I don't have any problems. I, I don't know why they say that sugar or salt, you have to lower your intakes. Uh, that's the only question I have. And my, 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 my father's brother, who was a diabetic, he, was, he always ate low and so low in sugar, and he died at 55. <laughs> and my dad is still a little strong at 87. Well, you know, there, there are outliers on all ends. You know, there are 90 year old smokers. Um, so some, you know, we're all dealt a stack of car, you know, a stack of card called genetics. And that accounts to about five to 10% of what happens to us. So, you know, if you have the genes, uh, you know, so your nutrition will affect those either in a, in a positive or a negative way. As we spoke earlier, our body runs on sugar. So whether it's a potato broken down into sugar or fruit broken down into sugar or green beans broken down into sugar, ultimately sugar is the basic thing that we, we use to, to generate energy with most, you know, most favorably. So if there's not, uh, you know, so obviously eating five tablespoons of sugar doesn't give you any other vitamins or antioxidants. They don't provide you with any anti-cancer benefits. It does provide you with energy. So it's a simple form of, of energy. And in and of, in and of an energy cell, that doesn't hurt you. But what you're not getting are the other nutrients that you need to protect yourself from cancers and, and heart disease. So if you have five teaspoons of sugar and a steak, then you're setting yourself up for problems. If it's five teaspoons of sugar and, you know, um, a very, very healthy diet and you're lean, then it's probably not hurting you tremendously. Um, on the other hand, we know that salt is a direct toxin to the blood vessel wall. So it makes the blood vessel wall very stiff. Um, that tends to drive blood pressure as well as when the blood vessel is stiff, you tend and you have the salt and you take in salt, then you, you tend to retain water along with it. So it leads to high blood pressure. We know by taking the salt away, um, or decreasing the salt intake, the blood pressure oftentimes comes down. 
there's salt in everything. There's salt in Swiss chard and spinach and celery. So if you just ate those vegetables and fruit, you would get about eight or 900 milligrams of salt a day. Um, sometimes seven to, seven to 900 milligrams of salt a day. If you're, you know, and then if so on top of that, if you're eating a bunch of other salt, then you're putting yourself at risk for blood pressure issues. Again, there are people that, you know, may be outliers, but that's not the majority. And the, the problem is that there's so much salt in processed foods today that typically you can get seven or eight grams of salt a day. Uh, and it can really lead to, to problems down the road. If you're eating a plant-based diet and you're just eating vegetables uh, and you salt them and you're lean and your blood pressure is good, then you're tolerating. You know, you're probably not getting that seven or eight grams of salt a day. Um, we know that when people take in salt in the form of fermented vegetables, uh, such as miso, it tends to be less toxic than just plain old table salt. So, you know, it, there is some variation, um, but the majority of people can't handle salt over time. Um, but I'm glad, you're great. I'm glad your dad did. Good morning, Dr. Delaney. Thank you so much. I'm Nanette, and several people have wanted to ask you this question along with I want to. Uh, when people get, they're walking or running or exercising, somebody says, well, take an Advil or take an ibuprofen. I try not to take any. Someone mentioned turmeric or curcumin. What would you take after a run? Or I usually find if I eat something that's whole food plant-based, I don't have to take those medications. Could you talk well, to us about medications? Yes. Um, I, I have people come in the office and they're taking these, what we call these Advils, and they're non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. They take pain away. Um, sometimes people take them so they won't get pain. And sometimes people take them when they do get pain. When you go for a run and you come back, your muscles might be a little tired or sore. And like you said, sometimes just e eating a whole food plant-based diet actually makes your muscles feel better. Um, and there's no reason, and most of the time, these non-steroidals don't, uh, they don't make muscle pain better. They, they may make some joint pain better if you have it, um, but there's side effects with them. They're, they're toxic to the kidneys, and they actually decrease the production of nitric oxide, and so they are associated with uh, coronary artery disease, increased heart attacks, and, and even perhaps cardiomyopathies. So I try to avoid them as much as possible. And if someone does have to take them for short periods of time, certainly not daily. They're also very toxic to the, the gastrointestinal system, can cause bleeding. The other thing that can happen with them is that when you, if you go for a prolonged, there are marathon runners that say, you know, when you run a marathon, your, your legs start to hurt a little bit and your feet start to hurt a little bit. So they say, well, I'll take an Advil before I start. That way I won't slow down because things are hurting. Well, the reality of it is when you start to get a little dehydrated, the adverse effect on the kidneys is even worse. And people can get what's called hyponatremia or more water in their system than salt. And it can be very dangerous. Um, they can also get gastrointestinal bleeding because blood flow is diverted when you exercise away from your GI tract. And so when you're exercising, it, it's going to make the side effects of these medications even more harmful. If you have joint pain, then turmeric is an excellent um, a supplement to take. And you can take it in the form of just uh, taking some turmeric root or turmeric powder and sprinkling on your food with black pepper increases the absorption. They actually make a turmeric capsule that you can take twice a day if something's hurting. But I don't recommend just average everyday muscle aches and pain because your body, your body tells you when you're injured or your body tells you when you should take a rest. And so by masking symptoms, feedback from your body, you're, you're maybe not listening and you might set yourself up more, for more injury. The other things that the non-steroidal do is they, they can actually make tendon issues worse. So if you twist your ankle and you take the, uh, say, a Motrin or Advil, it, it, you have a little bit increased risk of a rupture of that tendon. You know, Olympic athletes that have to race that next day and something, you know, they, you know, maybe if it's worse, the risk and you have a big race, then they're, they, they might take a pain pill. But the reality of it is, I don't think most people have that risk that or that need that they're willing to risk that much to take the risk of the, the non-steroidal. So I, I try to avoid pain pills as much as possible. And, you know, the other thing that you can, you know, foam rolling, 
Um, you know, uh, a, a buffer, you know, uh, there's a, people who have car buffers that they wax their car. Those buffers on the muscles really can make things, make your muscles feel good. Some heat, some cool, you know, so there's lots of other ways to treat uh, some muscle and joint aches besides taking medications. I have a question on the ongoing war about soy, whether or not just the tempeh and miso is good and the rest of the products should not be used. So that's a that's a great question as well. Um, tempeh is fermented soybeans. Uh, tofu is uh, processed much like cottage cheese is made, um, and so they're they're what we call very little processed soy. Uh, soy milk can can be just you know soaked and strained. Um, soy yogurt is easy to make without very little alteration in the in the soybean. Um, when you start getting into the faux meats and things, you have much more processing, much more additives. Um, they became they become um, like the things that they're trying to replace. You know, lunch and soy lunch meats are not a whole lot better than regular lunch meats as far as the sodium content, perhaps. When you look at soy itself and the risk, you know, the first thing that comes up is it an estrogen, and and will it promote breast cancer? The reality of it is, it's a phytoestrogen or estrogen like. So it actually blocks the estrogen receptor. Japanese men during World War II, uh, compared to American men that both smoked, had a lot less lung cancer and they ate soy every day. Japanese women, Chinese women that eat soy every day, a lot less breast cancer. So um, the reality of it is it won't increase your risk of breast cancer. Um, it, is, it tends to be, when it's processed, it, it's fairly high calorically dense. Um, there, there's a fair amount of fat in it. So if you're trying to lose weight, but eating a lot of soy products, um, you know, it, it can add some weight to you. But the, in general, the tempeh, tempeh is a wonderful um, substitute uh, for, uh, you know, I like tempeh Rubens and I like, uh, we, we, we use tempeh a lot as, as, a, as a meat substitute because it, it takes on a lot of flavors and it uh, has some texture to it. So I think it's fine. Yes, hello. Um, I have a question regarding uh, salt intake for people with low, uh, sorry, low blood uh, pressure. Or what can, what can be recommended? Well, I guess the that? first thing is if it low blood pressure associated with being symptomatic, dizzy, lightheaded, passing out. Because if your blood pressure is low, but you're not having any symptoms, then good for you. We know in countries that have very little heart disease, and you're born with a blood pressure of about 80, you know, 80 to 90. Um, so, you know, but if you're having episodes where you're passing out because your blood pressure is very low, then we usually tell people to drink more volume first rather than eat more salt. Um, and, and, and then you, you also have to look into other reasons for low blood pressure. You know, is there, uh, you know, some adrenal problem? Um, is there, there's occasional people that uh, actually have um, uh, what we call some autonomic uh, issues that their, their, their body kind of gets confused whether they're standing or, or sitting and their blood pressure can drop on standing. And sometimes those people actually need some medications to kind of help them um, you know, constrict their blood vessels and, and not have this, you know, dilatation. Um, but it's more, you know, if your volume is adequate and you don't have any symptoms, then I, I really wouldn't chase it with salt. I have a question regarding the comments that have been made about taking oil out of your diet. Um, I have Alzheimer's in my family history, and I always thought that oils are good for brain health. So that just strikes me as odd to um, take oils completely out of your diet. Um, that's, a, that's a really good question. So when we talk about oils, uh, let's, let's just use olive oil as an example. So it takes about 45 olives to make one tablespoon of olive oil. And we strip all the, the nutrients and phytochemicals uh, and fiber out of the olive. And we're left with this substance that we absorb into our bloodstream. And we know that it causes constriction or narrowing of the arteries directly. There's been studies that have shown um, that, it, that it happens actually very rapidly. 
So when you look at, and most Alzheimer's that we're finding is associated with small vessel disease in the brain. So when you have the oil effects on blood vessels that cause constriction, that's going to decrease your brain function. Now, if you're thinking about uh, the cell walls and the neurotransmitters of your, of your brain, um, and you're worried about not getting enough fat in your diet, let's, um, you know, um, pinch an inch, so to speak. You know, so if our body has fat, but we think we need to take in more fat, uh, to prevent Alzheimer's, it, that really has never been been shown, and nobody's ever really improved brain function by increasing saturated fat intake. You get plenty of your fat in your diet, um, you know, 10 to 15 percent with a whole food plant based diet. Certainly, omega threes, um, you know, in the form of, of flaxseed and some and some nuts and seeds are, are plenty adequate. There's fat in beans. Um, you know, there's a little bit of fat in everything about that 10 to 14 percent range is, is exactly what our, our body needs. So we're, no one has ever, you know, has a zero zero percent body fat. You know, even the marathon, the Kenyan runners uh, still have plenty of fat uh, to, stores to utilize when they're running. So there's you know, there's there's really no uh, indication that, um, you know, we lack fat. And, and there's one really interesting study looking at the genes for Alzheimer's and uh, the APO the APO genes, there's an APOE4 gene that's strongly associated with Alzheimer's. If you have one of those genes, you have three times the risk of uh, Alzheimer's. If you have two of them, you have nine times the risk of Alzheimer's in the general population. Um, the good news is Nigerians almost all have, or they have a very high incidence of having two genes, but they have a very low incidence of Alzheimer's, and, and they eat a main, mainly plant-based diet. And the, APO, the APOE4 gene carries is, is what the, is a principal gene for carrying fat and cholesterol. So we know by not activating these genes, people do much better. Dr. Delaney, could you give us a real quick intro of Addie and then we'll get started with your discussion of the two of you talking about how to adapt some of these recipes. Yes, it's my pleasure. Um, Addie um, has followed uh, in the uh, footsteps of a lot of my family. She went, um, she started her college degree, in, or college tour, I guess, in Emory in Atlanta, um, but decided that she wanted to pursue uh, a different career path and ended up with an exercise physiology uh, degree and a, and a um, strength and, and conditioning minor from West Virginia University. Um, she's always been an athlete and, uh, you know, I've drug her on marathon. So she's developed a love for running and she ran cross country and did hurdles and she played basketball. But when she went to West Virginia University, um, she decided that she'd try uh, the rowing team because they had a sign out that said, you know, walk on and, and do some novice rowing. So she'd meet uh, other people by joining the rowing team. One thing led to another, and uh, people kept getting cut, but Addie kept showing up to practice and actually made the uh, Division One rowing team there. So she uh, uh, developed, so had a nice rowing career for, for three years while she was getting her uh, ex-phys and strength and conditioning uh, degrees. And, and, and the um, interesting thing was that they had a sports nutritionist there that worked with the athletes and she really enjoyed working with her. Um, she's always wanted to pursue a career that helped people. And so uh, nutrition and uh, dietetics became uh, very interesting to her. So she decided to tack on a nutritional studies degree um, while at West Virginia. She completed that, and then she went on to Sage College of Dietetics to do her internship um, to be able to sit for the registered dietitian boards. Uh, not only do you have to complete a nutritional studies degree with biochemistry and, um, and anatomy and physiology, but you have to spend a year in all the various aspects of dietetics, whether it be food service, uh, clinical, hospital, uh, tube feed, children's, pediatrics. So she spent a year doing that and then has just recently passed her registered dietitian boards and uh, became a great fit. Uh, we talk uh, nutrition all the time, and so Addie has agreed to uh, work with my practice to provide registered dietitian services. So I am very pleased uh, to have her on board, and um, my patients love her, and I think you will too. So hi, Ed. 
Hey, Mom. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> What's a typical dish, and maybe you could pipe in to get us started, Abby, that, that you've taken and recommended to patients like mashed potatoes or whatever, whatever you come up with that they can adapt to be more plant-based? So I'll start off by giving just a couple of tips I give people um, just to kind of ease the process. Because I know when my mom talked earlier, um, she mentioned how, you know, the snowball effect of, oh my gosh, I have to completely change everything about how we eat in our house and how there's a lot of connection to the food we eat, a lot of emotional connections, as well as you know, our family history, how our parents cooked, how we were raised. So typically when I sit down um, with clients, you know, I discuss with them you know, what foods they like to figure out if they're picky eaters or not. And we start off as well with, you know, did your parents cook? If so, what kind of cuisines did they like? Do you like spicy foods and things like that? And then I typically go back and talk about components of a meal. So, you know, typically you want um, in a standard American diet, what most people follow is they have a protein of some sort, um, a starchy vegetable or grain and a vegetable. So really, we're not doing a whole lot different except we're taking out the animal product protein and adding in a plant based protein. So even if you just approach meals like that, it can become very simple. Um, and in, in terms of seasoning, you know, we're not doing oil or salt, but still having those amazing other flavors like paprika and cayenne. And I love garlic. You know, garlic can make just about anything taste amazing, even for my picky eaters. So um, when we start looking at meals like that, the anxiety kind of slips away a little bit. But in terms of mashed potatoes, um, if we want to start off with something as basic as that, you know, you're just, you're not using um, your butters and you're not using your milk. Uh, if you want to substitute in some plain unsweetened almond milk, that's fine. Or other kind of plant-based milks that you'd like, rice milk, hemp milk, soy milk, whatever you would choose. Just make sure it's not that vanilla sweetened kind because I'll tell you, I've done it on accident. It's not very good with garlic. <laughs> <laughs> but adding in um, some nutritional yeast, um, just to also a little natural way of getting that B12 in and some garlic and pepper. And if you like it a little smoky, adding in some smoke, smoked paprika, excuse me, um, that's a great way to have your mashed potatoes still. Um, as my mom mentioned, you know, we're Italian and um, my grandma, um, I call her Nunny, is a fabulous cook and, you know, we always crave her spaghetti nights and we don't have them very often and you don't want to load up on the pasta, but a great way to make spaghetti a completely balanced whole food plant-based meal is to add all those nutrient-rich vegetables to your sauce. So. I um, encourage, you know, never to buy the pre-made pasta sauces because, you know, they're laden with oils and sodium. So just using your diced and plain um, tomato sauce and then some crushed tomatoes, adding in vegetables, mushrooms, onions, zucchini, um, and then your greens. So a spinach or something of that nature, eggplant, if you want that, and really having it more of vegetable rich with some sauce to it and then a small portion of a whole grain pasta or gluten-free um, that kind of makes it a little bit more of a balanced meal and if you want to add into that some soy curls um, the dehydrated soy that um, we just briefly mentioned before or if you even want to add in some lentils um, I've done a really great power um, pasta sauce with lentils and broccoli and onion and a red sauce over um, some whole grain pasta. And that's been a great treat. Um, another one would be, um, you know, burrito night uh, or taco night, taco Tuesday. Um, getting those flavors in is very simple um, with your salsas and your hot peppers and chilies and garlic again, cilantro, uh, and really taking away the fat and the salt I've noticed allows us to taste those really rich flavors that can be in Mexican food. So switching out your ground beef for um, just any kind of bean, pinto or black beans. Um, we also do 
um, a raw taco filling of I soak sunflower seeds um, and then for about four hours, throw them in a food processor, blend them up with some sun-dried tomatoes that have been soaked, um, add a little um, spice to that. And that makes for a great taco filling that's rich in plant-based fiber, healthy fats, and plant-based protein. Um, so really focusing on the flavors you're searching for and then looking for foods that have those components in them um, is a great way to start menu planning for your week. When you get into baking, I always, you know, we can make them healthier, uh, but they're always going to be more calorically dense typically than some of your other meal options. But there are um, great transitional cheesecake recipes by using um, tofu, like a silken tofu, so a really smooth, creamy tofu. Um, and you're not baking it, rather, um, you, like, for example, um, for Thanksgiving, I have made um, what's turned into a little bit more like a pumpkin cheesecake with pumpkin puree, silken tofu, um, and then some sweeteners, and then your typical pumpkin pie spices, um, refrigerated in a crust. Um, we've done a date and nut crust with that, or making a homemade whole wheat crust as well. Um, that's a way to kind of do a cheesecake, if that helps. Something else that people want to eat, but they're not sure how to do it. Let's see, there was mention of avocado. Um, is avocado okay if we eat it in limited amounts? Yeah, so I mean, avocados um, are a great source of um, those healthy fats, but it's still they're very calorically dense. Um, and so, we just another food group that you don't really want to eat in excess, but it's also a plant food. So you are going to be getting some beneficial um, phytochemicals in there, but you know, still it's, it's a high percentage of fat in an avocado. So whatever rather you have avocado than butter, yes, but still it's very high in fat. So moderation is key there. They really like them. Oh, here's one. Macaroni and cheese. Macaroni and cheese. Now, maybe Dr. Blaney can answer this one because I know she's got a recipe for that one. Um, I have a good one. Oh, good. I don't know if it's exactly the first. Um, but mine is, and I also can make it um, the sauce into a queso, is with um, a butternut squash as the base. So um, you're slicing, um, you're skinning and dicing up a butternut squash. And you're cooking it along with, um, you would have pre-soaked um, about a half a cup to a cup of pre-soaked cashews. And this is going to make a lot of sauce. Um, and then adding those um, pre-soaked cashews and butternut squash as well as garlic, um, chopped garlic cloves into a pan of water, just barely covering the squash and cooking it till it's soft. And then I put everything in my Vitamix. I'll add in um, half a jalapeno if I'm going to do my queso or a spicy mac and cheese. Um, and put all of that as well as um, about a tablespoon or two of apple cider vinegar, um, a little bit of almond milk, like about a half a cup to a cup of plain unsweetened almond milk. Um, I might do um, a splash of soy sauce if needed, but I really am not, I'm, I try to stick away from any kind of added sodium just because as we discussed before, plants have so much in them as well. If you like a smoky mac and cheese, adding in some smoked paprika to that. Um, and I will tell you to make mac and cheese, so you're still getting that cheesiness with this, um, but to even make it uh, more nutritious is putting that over some cauliflower um, or even over a baked potato to get that cheesiness, but then you're also going to get um, some nutrients from the vegetables is a great way as well. Hamburgers, except we probably wouldn't make it with ham. What do you think about that? Is there a substitute for that? Definitely. I actually, um, there's a couple of um, different recipes for burgers. I actually have a whole book dedicated to burgers, but the easiest one that I find is three ingredients. So you're going to pick your bean. If you want to do a black bean burger, that's fine. 
or you can use pinto, navy beans, can cannelloni beans, whatever you would like. Um, and so it's, you're going to need beans, you're going to need oats, and then um, a sauce of some sort. So um, if you want um, a barbecue or if you want more of a buffalo style, and I encourage you um, to get a low sodium version of those. Um, and make sure you're looking at those ingredients because they do actually have really great um, limited option barbecue sauces. Um, and so you're going to do three cups of cooked beans uh, mixed with three fourths cup of oats. And then about a half a cup of your sauce of choice. And if you want to add in um, some other like some cilantro to that or if you want to add some parsley or some garlic or onion, you can add that in as well. And you mix all of that in a bowl and really squish it down so you're getting that um, kind of same kind of look as your ground meat would look. Um, everything's very well blended and then Preheat your oven to 400, separate your patties out. You'll get about six to eight patties, depending on the size with that. Um, and bake it for about eight minutes and then flip them and bake them for five or six more minutes until you can see a crust forming and you have a pretty good burger. Any other questions about food? Pizza. Pizza. Oh, I bet you can do pizza. Oh, um, wait, I need to do pizza. Oh, yeah, Dr. still there. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. So two ways. Of, so um, everybody, you know, the guys in the audience, they lost their grill because you became plant-based. Pizza is a great thing to do on your grill. Um, making the pizza crust with uh, whole wheat flour and some yeast uh, is pretty simple. And uh, so we do, uh, we typically do a couple different ways. Uh, a white pizza I'll make with a can of uh, artichokes and water and um, basil and garlic and spin that in my food processor and use that for the white sauce. And then I'll top it with tomatoes, spinach, uh, olives, and mushrooms. And uh, the other pizza I like with uh, some you know, tomato sauce. And then I'll uh, just, again, spinach and mushrooms and, and it's loaded, uh, onions, green peppers, olives, and uh, you can even make a little bit of uh, cheese if you want to use a little bit of cashews with some nutritional yeast and put those in the blender with a tiny bit of water. You can make a little dollop of cashew cheese just to, um, you know, put on your, to your fresh tomatoes. So that's my version. Okay, great. Well, you know what? You two are such good chefs. I think you have two envelopes, and what we're going to do is we're going to let you open what's in the envelope that was sent to you in mail from Chat and Chew, and when you, we're going to take our last blowout before we lose the, the Skype scan, and we're going to have you put your video on and hold up what you got in your package. So open your packages now. Quick, quick, do it before we lose you. <laughs> I don't know if yours is there or not. But anyway. oh! So now you have something when you make those mashed potatoes and all those other yummy foods. And Dr. Delaney, did you get yours? I did. It's beautiful, and I'm going to wear it to my nutrition class today. Okay. <laughs> Hers is a little bit different. Read to us what yours says. Mine uh, says... Chat and Chew says thanks. Dr. Delaney's playing strong and has a heart. Thank you so much.